Good morning. My name is Anthea Rosso, and I'm the founder and the program leader of a Dreamcatcher South African nonprofit organization. I'd like to welcome you today to this program that is going to focus on socioeconomic development. So, spill no more beans, let's get into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, please tell us about yourself, Anthea. Um, you know, um, my parents, my, my dad was, a, was a, a second generation Brit and he landed in East London. And so I was born by default because I was a premature baby. Don't talk about that to anybody, but it's true. And I was born by default in Oatsorn. And then I was really small. We went back to the Eastern Cape. So I was raised in the Eastern Cape in East London, which is in the heart of Closa land. Uh, and I guess you can hear the click, which I, that's what I grew up with. And my dad was a builder, and um, be, and because my dad was very fluent in in Corsa and in English and Afrikaans, he was you know he was very well known uh, to to work in the building industry at that time. And then um, he was headhunted and taken to build a couple of schools and churches and buildings uh, with teams uh, in Oatsorn. and that's how I landed in Oatsorn and was raised there, and. Um, when I was finishing school, I wanted to do something because I was raised in a very multicultural home uh, and very open and and loving and caring. So uh, I was uh, always doing voluntary work when I was at school uh, into the communities because my dad used to go to the communities, you know, and he used to train his, his people that worked for him. And then when I needed to study, I could not find something as I wanted to do. And uh, because it was very, uh, it was, I wanted to do communication, but I wanted to do mass and interpersonal communication. And I wanted to do psychology and I wanted to get into the mindset because I saw a lot of disparities in South Africa, different from what I was raised as, as in the Eastern Cape. And so it was always a problem to me. And I eventually decided, no, this is nothing because I can, nothing is going to please me. I have to go to, uh, so I studied through the University of South Africa because it was an international, it exposed me to the internet and international world. And that's where I did my degree, my post uh, graduate degrees in communication, psychology and sociology. So that is my background. And then eventually I landed up, um, into tourism because I saw tourism uh, as a vehicle to to actually connect people in my own country. Uh, I didn't see, you know, the, with because of our history, I um, it was always something that bothered me because I wasn't raised like that, and so I thought, you know, tourism is something if we travel around. Because I used to go back to the Eastern Cape with my dad every year and my parents. Uh, maybe we can, I can get myself involved in tourism, but I first did community development, obviously, and then I realized that this is a, this is something which women and unemployed youth and youth that can't go and study one day, but have got just the skills and basic hospitality within themselves, because, you know, we are so hospitable in South Africa. I chose tourism as the vehicle to create a transformation to create jobs, to correct the imbalances and to transform the tourism industry. Because the more I got into the industry, the more I realized that this industry is not representative of our country. And um, we have vast areas in South Africa, which is the most incredible country because I've had the good, good honor to travel around in the world. Our country is like no other country on earth. And I, I, you know, I just didn't see enough people traveling in our own country. And I then actually chose uh, to uh, do community development, but work with the Department of Social Services. And uh, I hit on the idea one day, why don't we make products that have never been done before? And South Africa is just this main, people are rushing through the country. They are going on routes that have been going on for 50 years. and but there's so much more in this country. Because also traditionally, you know, South Africans, if they're in the north of the country, those that could afford to travel and they do travel, they go south to the beach house. And then in winter, they go north to the Kruger National Park. But they miss our incredible country. 
you know, like Stutterheim and, and the Northern Cape and the, the Freistadt, you know, in Putitachaba, those places that I just traveled around in the country, every little nook and cranny into. So if we can get South Africans to travel around in our own country and um, like the Americans do, many people think Americans don't have no geography. Yes, you know, we inclined to have bias about this unconsciously. Americans don't know the global geography. Well, you know, the one thing that they did do well is not, not many people in, South, in, in America, if you compare their if you compare America's population, which is almost 400 million, about 12% to 14% of them have got passports. Because the one thing that America's done really well is sell its country to its people. So they have created destinations all over America that Americans aspire to go to. And so they travel around the length and breadth of the country. And so I thought, wait a minute, I need to create new destinations and new products. And this is where we could get the women in the townships of South Africa involved and the youth. And that's what I did. Uh, it took me 10 years to travel around and recruit women. And then we created the product called Cook Up with Kamama because I ate in so many townships in South Africa that are so gorgeous to people and my people. And I, I thought, you know, they, the women can make food in one pot, on one cooker or one fire. And it was scrumptious. Let us make cook up with Kamama. So fortunately, I registered the brand and we, we recruited women. And to this day, 20 years later, we still have functional cook up Kamamas. Uh, and the one social service uh, uh, director said to me, Anthea, 20 years ago, you created that Kamama and that Kamama in Nisna and George and that one there. And you know what? When I left the directorate 20 years later, they had created other jobs in their communities and they were still going. The, the cook up Kamama changed into the homestay with Kamama. So the homestays with Kamama was also registered. And then this, these two branded products I then had it, and then I decided, let's change the roots of South Africa and take it into Soweto, and take it into Paputitachaba, and Witsi's Hook, and take it into, into Malkert Fontaine, Still Bay, and take it into Darling's community, the people all go and see the flowers. So this is what I did. And at that point, uh, I had no knowing about it, but uh, communities, uh, the South Africa had been transformed and I took very seriously what uh, Madiba or Nelson Mandela said. He said uh, at his inauguration speech, let us all work together to create a better life for all. And I, I took that seriously and I made that commitment that I had been privileged in my life, though my mother and father worked extremely hard to put help me and I had to pay my way through university, my, my, my siblings as well. I need to put this back. And so uh, I took it seriously and I renewed and I went back into the communities because then we had the roots and then we also had the products. But we also needed to create destinations because the, you know, we've got Table Mountain and Kruger National Park and you've got uh, Sun City, but we need destinations to connect to as, as hooks. So I spent another 10 years creating destinations around the country, of which one shining example is the Wasteland Graceland project. This um, is in a community called Market Fontaine, situated uh, in the township uh, where they were removed to uh, six kilometers away from the most beautiful resort town in the country, one of them arguably still by. And people were zipping past this community and uh, at the Human Science Research Council, I contacted uh, Pete Krause and he said, you know what, Anthea, I'm picking up on Landau's research in 1967. It's now 1991. We're doing another research to find where are the destitute most in the country and also what is the, the scale of the disparities. And this Malkin Fontaine community was flagged up as one of the most desperate in the, all of the Western Cape. So I said, if I can put this project to work in this community, then I may have a model which we can implement around South Africa. 
And so saying no to many, many jobs uh, in mainstream tourism, because I, I felt if nobody was going to have to, do, I'll have to do this or I can't, I have to just change my name or something because I needed to do something to unite our people around our beautiful country and to use tourism as a marketing tool amongst ourselves to create social cohesion and, and, and community uh, amongst all of us. And, um, and then in that way, market our country as the best place on earth. So um, I did that and I was called the crazy white blonde. <laughs> Um, but it didn't matter to me because I was passionate about it. I, I said no to many jobs because I had a love affair with my country and its people. And so that was my mission, which I created for myself. Unbeknown to me, because I tried to market uh, the, the, this product and the destinations, I'll tell you now about Wasteland, Graceland and the other questions, um, people had nominated me onto the new transformation board of South African tourism. So when the facts came from Minister Vali Musa, I thought it was a joke. I didn't believe it because, you know, I had my boots and all. I took my high heel shoes off. I don't have any gel nails. You can see they're working nails. And I was in the communities getting in, mucking in, creating, painting houses and doing all sorts of things. So so the next day they, they phoned and said, listen, this is serious. You are being nominated to this National Tourism Board. By that time, I had already served on various local and regional tourism boards. And I was punting community-based tourism and people tourism and humanity in tourism. Because to me, you can't shake hands with an elephant. You can't. We need the people to make it work. And that, funny enough, we all want to go to Disneyland. That's what Walt Disney said. That was his buzzword. He said, look, you can create the structure. I've made it. You can create the most beautiful structures and plans, but you need the people to make it work. And to my mind, South Africa needs our people to make it work for South Africa. That's my philosophy. And um, so I said, all right, I'll go, but what am I going to go and do with the National Tourism Board? So they said, no, well, you know what? People from all over the country actually nominated you to represent the communities in South Africa. So I, I got up there. I had to put my high heel shoes on again in a pinstripe suit. And when I got there, I, I was representing the communities in the country. And I thought that I had a vision. I was definitely now where I needed to be after the initial shock because here I can really create the voice for new tourism products, new tourism experiences, expand our country to the eyes of international and therefore growth and open up more market segments than just the high-end luxury safari mountain. And, and that South Africa is far more than that. So um, um, when I got there, I was actually nominated to be the chairperson of the marketing committee and the transformation board, the marketing committee. And I had a very big board and representatives of large tourism interests and sectors uh, and a couple of, uh, of other sectors like religion and things like that. But most of the people on the board were people that were representing large products and like South African to, uh, uh, airways, large hotel groups, large tour operators. And uh, there was a gentleman called Reverend Martin and Vessels and he said, Anthea, you were in our community. You have spoken to our people and you have helped them. Let us, you, I'll join you and I'll back you when we put in the community experiences and the new experiences of South Africa into these routes. Well, that was a big fight. It, it didn't happen because it was just too new, I guess. And Minister Anakum said years later, uh, when he was Minister of Tourism in Cape Town a couple of years ago, Anthony, you were 25 years before your time, which is quite sad because 25 years later, we could have been far ahead, but it's okay. So um, when I was there, then I traveled the world to, tr to work at the national tourism boards around the world to work with the staff to transform into the new way of tourism. And um, when the third year I, I uh, um, was there, I realized that I wasn't going to change this 
that way because the tourism plant of South Africa, the roots were so old in the old ways that the, you have to change it in a different way. A top-down approach was not going to happen. So I decided, well, when the, my time was up, I, would, I didn't put myself up to be re-elected. I went back into what I was doing. And then I created Dreamcatcher. And Dreamcatcher is a non-profit organization. And that non-profit organization has, has the goal to create work and to transform the tourism industry with its benefits for all that will choose so. And they have access and opportunities. And I concentrated predominantly on women in, on low income, those who are unemployed, youth, and also included the vulnerable. Uh, for uh, so, and it was also a multi-dimensional product uh, a plan which I created, where I was working on not only the product. I had a pluralistic approach. A pluralistic approach is where you do things for the greater good of society in business. You ask yourself, if I'm going to put up this cooling factory, what is the potential impact for the community for the single plastic? When I'm going to create this mine, what is the impact on the communities that stay around it? So that the old monolistic approach to business was very entrenched in South Africa and is to this day. So, and that is when it takes all bottom line profit and that's it. There's no real thought about uh, the pluralistic society around it. So the dream catcher model is pluralistic. Um, um, it uh, uses tourism, to an enterprise creator, creation, crafting, and all the peripheral things that happen around tourism. Tourism is not just people that go to bed and sleep and walk around with suitcases. Tourism actually creates a whole host of peripheral jobs around it. So we set up the organization to address all these jobs so that there could be an ex ex expansion of job creation but the biggest focus would be to create enterprises. And there we would concentrate on predominantly disenfranchised women and youth who had never had the opportunity to benefit from tourism as enterprises. They had always only worked as services. And as one said to me one day, Anthea, I'm not a servant anymore. I'm a service. Yippee. So, um, Needless to say, I had a lot of fun in my life. I've spent years on the ground amongst the people of our beautiful country. And uh, I then took this product and I wanted to market it to the tour operators in South Africa. They thought I was crazy. They said, no, people don't want to go and see the people in the townships. No, people won't eat there. No, this has got to happen. We're not going to change it. So I said, well, you know, I, I've come this way. And the women I'd already seen were benefiting because I like to trial everything that I do. So I wasn't on a wild goose chase. I actually invited people, my friends, my family around to the Kamamas to enjoy their food and pay for it. I invited my friends and my family who, uh, 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 up north into uh, Zimbabwe and all over to come down. Um, I had a couple of students from abroad that had contacted me and I invited them to come and live and stay in the communities. And then they all loved it. So I knew this could work. And then I created a South African experience, not just uh, Anthea's experience, where I actually wanted to create more jobs and open up the country and therefore develop new travel routes with geographic spread. This would have people visiting this beautiful country, which is mine and yours. And so we created these routes. They still did not want to support it. Then Cheryl Carolis became um, uh, the new CEO of South African Tourism. And uh, I pitched it to Cheryl Carolis. And Cheryl said, you know what, this is lovely. I think I'm going to do that. 
What do you want to do? I said, besides the fact that we've gone to Indaba a couple of times, people are walking past us from abroad, and they say they would very much like to add this in, but who they are working with in South Africa, their inbounds don't want to include the, the product. Now, of course, working in tourism, I knew that. So uh, I said to Cheryl, can we launch the cook up with Kamamas there and introduce it in the international marketplace? And she said, yes, and South African tourism contributed to the, to the expenses. The Kamamas all went down, their home states, Kamamas, the cook up Kamamas from all over the country. And that was the place where they could come and eat in the restaurant. The visitors loved it. And they all said to us, we had a small stand outside too in the, in the arenas where we could have our little stand. They said, please, we want to add this. Now we're talking about 2001 and 2002. Can you, uh, can you sell this to our tour operators that are inbounds? Well, I tried that and it didn't work. So I said, you know what? There's only one thing that I have to do now is I have to sell my car and I have to go abroad. And I'm going to go abroad because obviously I had contacts abroad because my father comes originally his father from England and my godmother was in the Netherlands. So I said, right, um, I'll sell my car and I'll go market this product myself, which is what I did. And um, so uh, I spent sometimes months abroad visiting around and also through my godmother in, in, in the Netherlands, she introduced me to the CBI. And the CBI said, yes, sure, for the next nine years, you can come free of charge because this is what South Africa needs. As Dutch people, we want to contribute to the new South Africa. So I spent nine years at the various uh, platforms of the CBI. And I therefore did not need anybody in South Africa to market the Kamamas, basically at that point, because also closely attached to this product and experience is the humanity that makes us so unique and our Ubuntu that we have. And so therefore, um, we also concentrated on our development plan, not only on the product, not only on my accommodation establishment and my restaurant and my hotel. We created the Kamamas and the Kamamas could only become a Kamama and a booty if they committed, if they were taken up into benefits, they needed to look back at their local community because tourism happens where people love, live and die. That's my motto. So if the community it knows about tourism and if they benefit and they meet visitors from another country, then if they're not meeting fellow South Africans, they will create, get more confidence and know that they are, they matter. And, and so um, that's what I did. So we, we, we created the Dreamcatcher Kids, the Dreamcatcher Arts and Crafts for Humanity. We, we had holiday programs. We have a kick up with Kamama, which is for girls, an exercise program. We have uh, health and hygiene programs. We work with the local schools. We work with the vulnerable. We work with, with people that have got physical challenges because we include them into our products and our projects. Like we've just finished a project called Waste It's Mine, It's Yours. Um, and this project, um, I actually pioneered in England, for England. I can share that with you later. And they are taking all the single-use plastic out of the community, which has been burnt and uh, taken to landfill sites, which are bad for the environment. We are teaching the community about the importance of the environment, that they live in the environment and that they're, they're custodians of it. And so this experience, when people come to South Africa, the dream catch away, it is about everything that will make South Africa sustainable. So the mindset of South Africans is normalized, if we can call that a new normal. And the people in the communities and the township communities, like the one lady said, um, the one Kamama said, you know, Anthea, I'm now somebody. I was nobody, but I'm somebody now.
because people from overseas think I'm somebody. So I must be somebody. So for me, the psychological growth uh, and the children's opportunities we've been creating for them. For instance, now uh, uh, they're in the COVID. We were, we were supporting the, the enterprises in tourism that are struggling because tourism hasn't been booked. But because we had created other projects, we don't only have tourism because tourism isn't everything in the country. There are other things like farming, like growing your own food, like health and welfare in the communities. So we have trained first aiders that have been trained for years. So when COVID kicked in, we were certificated and they could go and help take temperatures from a distance. They could put the food parcels down. They could supply the PPE. So we are looking after a whole community's growth and vision and that they can see, yeah, I can actually go into tourism as a career. But wait a minute. I can also go into the environment as a career. I don't only have to be a servant in a restaurant. And I don't only, if I can't afford to go to uni, maybe I can then become a tour guide. And so this is where we've diversified. So we look at the whole community and a destination. We look at what they have, because that's also interesting. I was told, listen, there's nothing in that community of Marketfontein. Nothing worth selling. Nobody's going to go there. So we're not putting them in. And that is where I am today. So now you know everything. Well, wow, that's a beautiful story. You've come a long way. Yeah. Um, are, the, the, the initiatives that you just mentioned now, are those current? Uh, are those current initiatives by Dreamcatcher? Yes. They're current initiatives because, you see, besides we didn't squat because the cook-up kamamas didn't only stay cooking. They're growing their own food, you see. So when COVID came, we had a own food garden which could would look after that. Uh, the, some of the kamamas, um, yes, they are they they are cook up kamamas, but if they're not tourists, they can still connect the waste. So they are waste merchants. Uh, the children are doing still the arts and crafts for humanity because. We're picking it, they're picking up all the porcelain because you've got a massive uh, waste training course for them, which I can share with you. And this training course is called Waste It's Mine, It's Yours. And it was a project when I was in, in, in the UK. Um, somebody approached me and said, Look, you 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 inter, inter you integrate so beautifully with different cultures. You are so at home, you're not reserved like many of us in England are. Would you be interested in doing something to volunteer in waste? And so I had training through University of Brighton in waste management, because I'm very passionate about the environment. I volunteered across Britain while I was doing stuff for Dreamcatcher. And there um, I picked up so much firsthand knowledge about waste management that actually you can do it at your home and it can, can, and it can be a resource to you that I invited the University of Brighton uh, to come to South Africa. So all the Dreamcatcher Kamamas have got training in environmental management and in waste management, you see. So um, now we expanded that. The British Council, uh, invite, we invite, were invited to, to, to quote and to put in a grant that last year, which we did. On the project waste it's mine it's yours and incidentally in the uk then i received the gatwick diamond award as the green champion because i had gone through 31 local authorities and actually you know there were a lot of migrants and a lot of uh, people refugees that were in the communities and i created community cohesion between cultures around waste and the environment and so that 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 happened and i was completely gobsmacked by it <laughs> so then I, you know, back in South Africa, Dr. Woodard came across with his team. They trained the kamamas, the youth, the children were trained in why, how important is, is it not to, uh, you know, to look after the environment because you're the custodians of it, it's your future. And so the British Council, fast forward, said, listen, they accepted our proposal. And so uh, in the community of Malkinfontein, there was no recycling. 
so the waste merchants were trained and the plastic um i can show you i can ask i can go and get some things for you the plastic uh, the single use plastic and the hdpe plastic uh, had been turned into beautiful artifacts and it's many many women and youth some of them had left school in 2008 with a final year matric certificate they had no work and we know that unemployment is very high in south africa it's as high as 53 percent and sometimes almost 80 percent in other areas so they've made the most beautiful artifact because the university of brighton brought down a whole team and they were taught from you know how to handle the waste the processes of it and to turn it into beautiful crafts and they have been selling abroad i have been marketing for them uh, visitors come to them. So the youth um, are making beautiful works of art, uh, having learned to draw, and that's being sold. And so many of them want to now go into a graphic design uh, future. And then there's porcelain. People throw porcelain away. And in, this, they, in November last year, they made beautiful cement blocks, which they changed to depict the culture and their surroundings with all the porcelain that people throw away. And they sold that and they had money for school shoes and school fees. And so all the projects that we run always grow with the needs that the world dictates around you. And so we're not stuck in a glass cage in tourism and the environment we are changing the environment with the people to partner them for survival and sustainability. Now in the community of Market Fontaine, they were burning the waste for a long time. So that also contributed to global warming. And then we're working with the local ecosystem now. We've created partnerships with the local authority. Uh, I'm very fortunate and honored that I am providing them with, with ideas and with strategic input with the communities on how to what is would work sustainably for waste management and the work continues because the teams across the world want to come back and do this and then finally we in market fontaine people said they wouldn't come so there were two things which we changed uh, the one is we took a whole waste dump site and we revamped it into a botanical garden which is called La Blumen. And that was a botanical garden today. But 10 years ago and eight years ago, it was a waste dump site and it was overgrown with one of the biggest decimators of our fame boss in, in the country, which is Acacia Cyclops. It is an invader species that was brought into South Africa over 80 years ago, planted to stabilize the dunes for the beach houses and for the developments in the flats. And that spread across our country and has killed our beautiful fainbos. Now, South Africa is almost 11.5% of the world's natural habitat in terms of botanical species. So we are the botanical kingdom of the world. So this community was living with all the, their beautiful environment killed, fainbos gone, dump site. And so we changed that into a botanical garden. So today, uh, we've called it Wasteland, Graceland. And that, uh, that botanical garden is now part of the UNESCO biosphere. So you see what I'm saying, you, if you create new destinations in our critical country, we don't look at the dump site and at the community and say, oh, we can't go there because look what they look like. We say, I said, yippee, this is a resource. This wood is a resource, let's use it as a craft. And it's never been used before as a craft because they used to burn it up for barbecue wood. This plastic is a waste. Let's use it as a resource. So we've turned the challenges into opportunities. The other challenge that there was, the community is known as the forgotten people. Though the incredible significant history was discovered on walls at the Blombos Cave in 1991, that they were the first people globally up to this day that had, that had actually taken the lifestyle on day to day 60,000 years ago and had painted it on the walls of a cave that they discovered. And as I went down through the sediments, 
they found that this community was living a reasonably sophisticated lifestyle. They were, but they were using the environment and nature wisely and sustainably. And so the community, the children, it wasn't in the school curriculums. So we thought, what can we do to create the, make the town beautiful and also let people become proud of their heritage because they hadn't heard about it. So we got Professor Mike uh, uh, de Jong, a globally renowned anthropologist. He came and gave lectures in the community. We brought, we created a project called Paint Up with Kamama and Booty. And they, uh, we invited down Bruce Rimmel, a world-renowned mural artist painter, but also goes to the Mayan art, Minoa, all over the world, Incas, and he helps them to paint their history. And so Bruce uh, Rimmel comes to South Africa every year and teaches the youth and the Kamamas and the people to paint the history back onto their walls. So we've created the largest walking history book in South Africa on the walls in the community that nobody wanted to visit. So now it's called Wasteland, Graceland. And this is what we, this is the passion that I have that I think, because without any marketing from any organization in South Africa, except in the National Tourism Board, that's not supposed to uh, uh, market a specific product, only just the destination. We've, we've marketed it abroad and people have been coming in their droves. But they're not only coming to tour in the country, they're coming to make contributions back to our country. And so this is a whole way of life. You asked me today what has been the result. I can share with you that one of our kamamas, only one of them, I'll just use her as an example. Three of her children, the one, Gordon, is a qualified chef today, he went to college. The second son, his third year, and the school starts now, he's training to be a teacher in Wellington. And the daughter, Elise Marie, that was a dream catcher kid and she struggled with maths when she was small. Volunteers came from abroad and inspired English speaking. So we have English lessons. The school principal says the children speak the best English language in the school. But Elise Marie learned to love maths and science. So the two Dutch benefactors sat with her like that and the other children the whole holiday, three weeks. And she became one of the best in maths in the garden route. And she's the only student, final year matric student with many, many A's. And Elise Marie Solomon will next year be a second year medical student. So she's training to be a doctor. She's told me on my knee, I'm going to be a doctor one day, dream catcher. That's amazing. They used to call me dream farmer. That's so this is, the, this is the result of what is possible through um, looking at a community, not as they are, but as they could be. And then you help them to become what they should be. That's my philosophy. Amazing. And tourism is just a vehicle. Great. That's great stuff. That's amazing. And keep that, keep that vision in mind and keep that philosophy because it, it's working for you. <laughs> um, yeah. Now tell me something. Um, as a woman, as you've mentioned, you told me in your story that you've been called a, a crazy blonde woman. Um, do you feel like gender inequality uh, 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 has, has played a part in, in, in your, you know, in, in your journey? Decidedly. Because uh, tourism in as the classic mainstream tourism as it used to be was, I would say, 90, more than 90 percent, even more, were owned and run by males. And women were more in the administrative side. It was only after transformation that that became to change a bit. And uh, I think that Cheryl Carolus, when she became the CEO of, um, of South African tourism, that changed. But that is not only in South Africa. That is also so 
for a lot of mainstream tourism globally. It is now the last number of years that women have started to rise up to become more involved in the ownership of tourism, of the enterprises. And this is what, why we, what we said, the women must own their own business. That Kamama owns her own business. That youth girl owns her own art project so that we could instill from a young age leadership in industry and in enterprise. And tourism has still got a long, long way to go. But I do not feel that there should be a delineated mod, uh, like a, a right and a left side of the continent. Whilst women certainly need to be grow up into the ladder of the tourism management and also the tourism ownership, I believe that humanity should play a larger role in the tourism experience. Because if that had to play a larger role, instead of just visiting things, working and visiting people, we could also normalize the industry in that way. Um, I know that on the Africa uh, tourism leadership, the, the tour guides um, from Uganda, they won the award and they are all a group of women tour guides and they own it. So I, whilst it was definitely so big time in the past, um, and there's a long, long way to go, I believe that through projects like what we are doing, women are seeing more how they could own a product, run a product, but also they could manage a product and uh, normalize it in that way. But this is not going to happen overnight. It's got to come from creating that passion uh, with from children in its schools that they can actually do this. And this is why I'm extremely honored um, to have been approached by the Department of National Education uh, and also uh, working with the, with in the Western Cape to collaborate with them because the new tour, the new uh, curriculum, like it's called the E3 curriculum, which is enterprise, education, employability. So I'm passionate about people being trained to be employable and to be entrepreneurial. But it shouldn't happen when you are leaving school, you, you should already develop that lust to be your own boss from a much younger age. You must become thriftier and it should go beyond the tuck shop that they run at school. So I'm so honored to work with a fabulous team uh, in, the, in, the, in national education and give input into it, give input into the curriculum uh, and also to act as a case study. So when educators eventually start implementing this, that they as leaders can visit some of these destinations created and see how enterprises actually proliferated through the whole community in different categories of business and, and work and jobs so that we could open up the job field. Because uh, I know that I could possibly be hung out to drive for this, but I believe tourism, tourism hasn't created the jobs that it said it would create. And we can't only look at national government. They have a large role to play. This should be a partnership. And we should level the playing fields and be, by leveling it up to to ask ourselves, what can I do with my product for my country? We shouldn't look at a, at a group of elephants and say, what can those elephants do for my product? True, it, should true. Be, it should be the other way around. I now, know that's very controversial, no, but that's but, the way. But it's necessary. It's necessary. And, and, and we have to be courageous. We have to be brave. And we truthful. have to be courageous. Because, you know, in the end, what I do know, and it's what visitors say to me, uh, somebody wrote to me the other day, Anthea, I can't wait to go back to South Africa. She says, you know, she says, the first trip I booked to South Africa, it was all glossy magazine and high end luxury. And when I got actually to the game reserve, I saw there were people riding around in their own old car and the elephants were there anyway. So I said, yeah, but the elephants don't ask you which lodge you stay and how much you paid for your night. They come out anyway. So that is the, the philosophy which I have. And so therefore I believe we can create more jobs and we should as 
enterprises and as, as developers, we are all passionate about our country because this is what is also written to me. She says, the sadness about South Africa, which I find, this is a doctor that says this to me in philosophy and um, we're partners, a doctor, a medical doctor. She says, everybody loves South Africa. I don't see them all loving themselves. They love themselves and their country, but they don't love each other. And wow. we have to learn. We have to learn to do that. Because what COVID-19 flagged up, by the time COVID hit, because I'd been in, in uh, abroad and I noticed what was happening in February, I was at the marketing uh, and uh, I noticed that. And um, when I got back to South Africa, we immediately started to prepare, buy PPE, prepare, uh, make up parcels and and uh, I ate, you know I monitored and I also uh, transferred and rented the first aiders. So uh, when COVID struck, we were ready to reach out. But what COVID has proven worldwide, and also this tragic death of George Floyd, is that people matter, and that we can't live in isolation in the world in which we find ourselves, because the more you live in isolation, the more unsustainable you become. And the more you live with your product and yourself alone, the less sustainable you are. Because tourism ultimately and business in any field, the success of it must be tied to the impact on the local communities, the impact on the employees. If we all love South Africa, as this lady, said to me, she said, you're all passionate, whatever culture you are, she said, wherever I've got, you love the country. You need to start loving each other. She said, because you know what? You're only going to survive if you start loving each other. And that's true. And, and stepping back. And I think that when I'm not here one day, I'd like my legacy to be that this is God's country. And he gave it to us. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we leave behind of ourselves to make sure that South Africa remains sustainable? Or do we think we can take South Africa with us when we die? It's only our footprints that we leave. So I, I do know uh, from experience now with COVID, I'm so proud that from all over the world, people from all over the world, students, lecturers, interns, visitors, they all sent emails. They all said, how can we help? And they all said, we will be back in here. So I know that um, somehow, somehow we've done something right. And um, I'd like in the future for folk to take a step back and forget about the past and think about the future together. So, um, yeah. True. And we have to make inroads that way because the status quo is totally unsustainable. True, true. Um, so, Anthea, uh, because of time constraints, sorry, we just got two more questions to go. Um, yeah. Sticking with gender, gender equality for a little bit. Um, yes. Do you feel that poverty and inequality feed into gender-based violence? And what, what can we do to start to change the narrative? Well, I, I, I certainly think so. Um, when you are poor and you've got no opportunities and you are attached to a, a male that gives you money and gives you status because you're his wife or his girlfriend, you become subservient. And in that way, you lack confidence in yourself. That's why the, the Kick Up Kamama project uh, it's on our website. It's specifically uh, for women and girls to, to, to feel good, good and confident, confident about themselves through, the, through their exercises and to think about nature. I do believe so. And that is why I'm passionate about the 3E project at the Department of Education, because across the board, uh, girls will learn alongside boys that this is something which we are on equal footing for. And if girls go into enterprise more 
with gaining confidence, they learn to earn their own money. When we started with, and I can say this unequivocally, when we started with Dreamcatcher, none of the women had bank detail, bank accounts, none of them. Today, they all have bank accounts. And there has been a great partnership developing in the households where the Kamamas are today, because they have become, become people that are somebody, as Mama Esme says. So there's been a balance in that community that the woman has become an equal contributor to the, commu to the community, to the household. And in that way, there is no gender violence in the Kamama households. I, I would like to speak now only about my personal experience and as a social uh, science researcher and as a so behaviorist, I've watched it grow. That today women are contributing to their children's education, to their household income, and there's a balance. They've got confidence, and also through our programs, we teach the girls and say, if you're in a relationship, the first time that you see something is not right, you need to speak up. So therefore the Kamamas are tied together in a network. They got to speak up, they got to speak out. So I believe that there is a lot that we can do and uh, confidence and leveling the playing fields. And as I say, level up, let's level up even the gender uh, uh, balance in our country. Because, um, you know, there's no, a woman is better than a man and a man is better than a woman. Because women are born innately through their development to multitask. So a woman can do things that a male, for instance, then is not so comfortable with. But then the male does something that a woman is not comfortable with. Why can't it be a partnership? The same with the environment. Why must we trash the environment with waste? Why can't we protect the environment so that we can enjoy it in our children and our futures? So yeah, I believe that tourism does and business on all levels because through tourism, there are many peripheral jobs today in the dream catcher teams. They, they don't do handle tourists, but they actually do different things. They collect waste, but they still enterprises. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, now, my last question would be, what are Dreamcatcher's goals for the next five years? Um, I, would, I would like the message to be spread amongst the youth because they are the future of our country. And everybody up to the age of 30 to 35, I would like to reach out. And if there's anything that I could share and help with, to, to because they will be the decision makers of the future of our country and they will be running the country. So I'd like to invest even more of my time into youth. I would like to invite, um, invite people that are involved in the environment uh, to join or for me to join them or my organization so that we could actually work together to create sustainable environments specifically around the issue of waste and global warming of which through through by default i today am working with the university of brighton in the uk and also uh, with utopia in america and the university in canada all that knowledge uh, together we can actually help that communities can take ownership of their own environment where they live then that way it's less work. I'd also like for tour operators in South Africa to be motivated to actually use the new tourism routes and add them in because I believe COVID has given them an absolute golden opportunity to, uh, to, to in their new normal, to actually take on board the new normal just of myself, but there are others like us and Dreamcatcher to take on board their roots and include that into their tourism experiences so that they actually contributing to South Africa in that way as well to job creation. And I also like to share this story of how it's possible for a, for a woman that only passed her sixth grade in school
to become a manager in a dream catcher office to create that hope and vision and um, also to share this awards which I'm so honored to have received globally to say that this has come out of South Africa support us because look at all these women and men and youth that are just waiting for the next opportunity to come and I'd like to work with educators to change education in a way that it's purposed to the needs of a country and then of a region and then of a community so that people can actually stop aspiring that they must go to university otherwise there's no future for them but they can actually make their own future where they live i think that will address urbanization to a large extent because people urbanize because they can't see a future where they live so I, if 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 I, if I have any more years and days of my life i'd like to be as useful as possible for my country because i love my country and all the people in it and if if that is has been my destiny then i'd love to share that wow that you spoke so beautifully um wow that's amazing anthea you're an amazing woman um otherwise anthea thank you a lot man thank you a lot um i can't thank you enough <laughs>